My name is Ryan Morshead. I'm the creator of iDOM, and I'm going to be talking about how iDOM is like React, but in Python. iDOM's a new framework for building full stack interactive web applications in pure Python. And I think it can be best compared to other solutions like Plotly Dash, Streamlit, PyWebAO. Basically, if you're trying to build a web application, but you don't want to learn JavaScript, just like was mentioned a little bit earlier. So before I talk about iDOM, I want to talk a little bit of history and give some insight into why I created iDOM in the first place. Like, why does it need to exist? I'm going to start with that by talking about the IPython notebook. So the IPython notebook is a browser-based interactive computing environment uh, for Python that came to popularity around 2010 to 2012, at, at a time where Python was relegated to being a back-end uh, technology that really just rendered HTML templates. Well, in years prior, that might have been OK. There was a growing need uh, for browser-based interactivity. And at that time, uh, Python really didn't have a good answer for that. Through the notebook, though, with its uh, rich graphical output, uh, Python developed an answer in the notebook. And uh, the notebook has really remained popular today in the form of JupyterLab and the rest of the Jovian ecosystem that has succeeded it. And part of the reason that uh, Jupyter and what was previously the IPython notebook has remained popular is this technology called IPyWidgets, which is a related project that uh, came about around 2012, and it leveraged the IPython notebook's APIs to give Python some bi-directional communication with the browser. And thus it brought interactivity to Python beyond what you could just get from a standard REPL or even just the graphical outputs that you were originally getting in the notebook. Um, so from this example here, we can see there's a basic slider. And as you move it back and forth, it's triggering some Python code that in turn uh, prints out, uh, I guess, the square of the number that's on the slider. Um, so I also want to emphasize the fact that IPyWidgets was especially important not in just growing the popularity of the IPython notebook, but also in growing the popularity of Python among scientists because it allowed for the creation of interactive computing tools by non-engineers. And scientists no longer had to learn JavaScript in order to make user interfaces for themselves or others that would make their work more understandable and accessible. Since the IPython notebook, we've grown spoiled for choice in this uh, kind of domain. You have Bokeh, Panel, Plotly Dash, Streamlit. Um, and even IPyWidgets has kind of become a UI framework in and of itself through tools like Voila that strip away the, the whole notebook interface um, and just show you the, the, the outputs of your code. But before we get too excited about this progress, uh, I want to take a step back and talk about what some of these frameworks could do better uh, because many suffer from a similar set of problems. Um, and the way I want to do that is by looking at what has happened in the world of JavaScript UI frameworks as of late. And this is where the React part of the title comes in. Um, and just for some context for myself, uh, how many of you guys have at least heard of React? OK, that's a lot. Um, even at a Python conference, that's <laughs> it's pretty impressive, right? Uh, so I think it goes to show like how important React is that a bunch of just Python developers know what this JavaScript technology is. Um, and if you haven't heard of React, don't worry about that. Part of the point of this talk is that I don't want you to actually have to learn JavaScript and React. Um, and uh, basically what I want to focus on with React is what it got right about uh, building UIs and how that's informed uh, IDOM as a technology. So basically, in this world of JavaScript UI frameworks, around 2015 to 2017, there was this paradigm shift where these new declarative uh, JavaScript frameworks like React and Vue started gaining popularity over old imperative ones like AngularJS. And just looking at this graph here, uh, this trend is rather decisive. Um, and React isn't going anywhere anytime soon. So to understand why this is, I want to discuss uh, those two terms I just mentioned, imperative versus declarative. And at a high level, what these two terms mean is they refer to programming paradigms. And depending on what context you're working in, what paradigm you're using could just be a stylistic choice, when you might not even be fully aware that you're making, or it could be something that's kind of uh, restricted for you by the framework you're using or the language that you're using. So what's the difference between these two? 
um, well, what it means to operate within an imperative paradigm uh, if you're developing a web application is that you as the developer are responsible for defining the states that your app evolves through, but you're also uh, responsible for dealing with all of the details of the transitions between those states. How do you get from A to B? Um, so you kind of have, you're forced to have a lot of fine-grained control over all of what's happening in your application. In the declarative paradigm, though, on the other hand, uh, you're only responsible for defining the states that your application uh, evolves through, but you're not necessarily responsible for dealing with all of the details of the transitions. That is handled for you by the framework or the language that you're using. So um, why are these declarative JavaScript frameworks gaining market share over the, uh, the imperative ones? Well, you may have noticed from the description I just gave that in the declarative paradigm, there's just kind of one less thing for uh, developers to worry about. Now, this comes at the cost of some control, but usually we aren't concerned with that because uh, in the process of implementing all of these transitions, uh, we can introduce bugs, and it's just a lot of work. So given all this context about what's happened in the JavaScript world, we should look back at the, this uh, kind of ecosystem of Python UI frameworks that's, de that's developed and ask whether or not they've kind of learned this similar lesson that um, building UIs using declarative patterns makes is easier uh, and easier to do correctly. And unfortunately, no, not really. Almost all of these in one form or another uh, suffer from uh, the, the problems of imperative design patterns. Plotly here uh, might be one exception, but it's limited in, in some other ways that I'll touch on later. And so this is where IDOM comes in. Uh, unlike its peers, IDOM takes heavy inspiration from uh, the React UI framework and thus has many of its same declarative virtues. Beyond that, though, uh, IDOM as a UI framework for Python is unusually powerful because it puts nearly all the same capabilities of React into the hands of Python developers, which, mind you, React is a JavaScript framework. Um, and having near parity with the features of a JavaScript framework is kind of unheard of. I, I personally haven't heard of anything that, that does this. Um, so what can you make with IDOM? Um, well, let's just go here and look at some of these. Uh, so in IDOM, you can make some kind of basic interactive dashboards. And the interesting thing about this is I implemented this in pure Python. I didn't even have to write a JavaScript binding to this victory charting library to get this to work. Um, and this is a little bit slow because of all the things going on right now. But yeah, you can see this is, this is working live. Um, here's another example of me integrating with a JavaScript library without having to write any JavaScript binding. This is the pigeon mapping uh, library. And I can also use some basic HTML components, uh, just like this little audio bit here. Um, and you can see I get some in event information back from this as well, like what is the current time in the audio. And the other cool thing is I have all the same uh, awesome bits of Python. Like I have this matplotlib plot here. Like sometimes you really can't, matplotlib is extremely fully featured and sometimes you can't beat it. Um, and this last example here I think is, uh, while it's not a particularly practical example, um, I think it does demonstrate like the complexity that you can, that you can get with IDOM. I challenge anybody to try and implement Snake using uh, <laughs> Streamlit or something like that. I think it'd be a great challenge. Um, so, so this is all pretty cool. Um, oops. So what does it actually look like to create something with IDOM? So I'm going to try and do this live here. It's a little bit low. So maybe I can type like this. Um, so. Sorry about this. So I'm going to import IDOM. Oops, this has happened every time I've tried to do this. OK, cool. So I'm going to import IDOM. That's the first thing I'm going to do. And the very next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define what's called a component. And a component is basically just uh, an uh, independent and kind of isolated portion of your UI that you can reuse over and over again. And it allows you to just think in the context of that component without having to worry about the rest of your, your user interface. And you create these components uh, using functions. Now, just to get started here, I'm just going to create a little button that just says hello. And then I'm going to run it. Now, 
in this demo, this is happening live. Uh, but if you were to actually do this for real, you have some little message in your terminal saying that there was a server that was started. You navigate to the URL. Um, and then, then you'd see this little button show up. Uh, so the next kind of expansion that I want to do on this is I want to make this button track the number of times that we click it. And this is, for people who are familiar with React, this is going to look incredibly similar to anything that you would normally do in React. But for people who aren't, it might look a little bit weird. Um, and I don't really have time to go into all the details on this, but I would encourage you to investigate, uh, not just say this looks weird, uh, but investigate it a little bit. Because like I, I tried to demonstrate earlier, these kind of declarative patterns have really won out in the JavaScript world. So we shouldn't just dismiss them here. Um, so the way that we're going to do this is we're going to use what's called a hook. Oops, this is again. And basically what's happening here, oh goodness, that's not happened before. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Hopefully, I don't run into that same bug. Okay. Well, <laughs> I don't think we're going to get to look at this. Um, so basically, um, yeah, this is crashing the whole thing. Shoot. Classic. Okay, so we're going to skip over this. But basically, what IDOM does is it uses a, a pattern called uh, hooks that is adapted from React. And uh, the way it works is that you get back this kind of count, and you get this set count callback back. And when you call the set count callback, that function that I was defining before will actually get rerun. And instead of modifying an existing button, you actually return a new button that includes the new count. So it's a kind of a different pattern. And if we were to look at this code in, in IDOM, uh, it would look almost identical to this React code here. Um, it's not super important that you understand this JavaScript code, but you can s you, there would be the, kind of this similar pattern of having a function. You'd have this hook, and you'd return this button that has an event handler uh, attached to it. OK, hopefully we're back on track now. So. Um, how does this work, and why haven't some of these other UI frameworks done the same thing? Well, um, the main reason they haven't is comes down to their general architecture. Items peers, uh, I think Plotly Dash is a particularly informative examples here, example here, go down the route of synchronizing uh, models between the server and the client. And so basically what that means is that the model is representing some underlying uh, state of the application. And the server is, uh, changes the model, and it sends it over to the client. And the client turns that model into the actual view that you end up seeing. The problem with uh, designing things in this way is that the responsibilities of uh, displaying something to the user are divided between the server and the client. The server is responsible for updating the model, uh, the model state. And the client is responsible for turning that model into the view. And since Python developers are stuck on the server, um, you basically lose out on having control over how that model turns into the view that you actually see. IDOM, on the other hand, uh, goes this route of synchronizing a representation of the view. And that representation is called VDOM. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details of what this VDOM is, because that could be an entirely separate talk in and of itself. Um, but as a result of this, it gives Python developers control over how the model, uh, the underlying model of their application, is being converted into the view. And the specific 
uh, implementation here shows how these kind of composable components that I mentioned earlier get put together. They create this representation of the view. And what the layout does is it looks at the, the last time that the, the view is rendered, and it looks at this time, checks for the differences, and it only sends the differences over to the client. Um, so uh, given this, uh, that's how uh, IDOM gets so much control over what's happening. So the last thing that I want to touch on here um, that is enabled by this kind of pattern as well is ecosystem independence. Um, and actually, I'm realizing this is maybe a, another good way to like show you that example I was trying to before. So what this, what this means is that um, a lot of these other frameworks kind of lock you into their way of doing things. And if you were to write a JavaScript component or even on the Python side, uh, if you were to try and take that to somewhere else, like, I don't know, if you wrote something in Streamlit and then you wanted to take it to a Jupyter Notebook or vice versa, that's simply not possible. But with IDOM, you can take the exact same code that you might use in a, standard, a standalone application and just run it, say, in a Jupyter Notebook. And you can see all these same examples from before um, just kind of show up. The other especially cool thing uh, about doing things in this way is that um, integration with JavaScript is incredibly simple. I was talking about how, uh, uh, how I didn't have to write any JavaScript bindings to get some of these examples to work, uh, like this plot here. And that's because I'm just loading them right from a CDN. And here's an example of that. Here's a material UI button, if anybody's familiar with that uh, kind of UI uh, style, style thing. Um, I'm just loading it directly from a CDN and very little Python code to make that happen. Um, and yeah. So, uh, so yeah, that's kind of the, the end of the content. So given that my demo didn't really work before, uh, hopefully I should have an opportunity here to go through and show you what I had wanted to do before. So I've been trying to do this demo little component. And I was trying to get this count, set count. OK. And we have this hello text to start out. OK. This is working. <laughs> OK, so um, basically what's going on here uh, is, uh, so what I was trying to explain before is this concept of hooks. And basically what's going on with this use state thing is it returns some count, which defaults to zero. And I also get this callback, which allows me to, up, to update, update the count later. And when I call this, it's not going to like modify an existing button, like I was mentioning before. It's actually going to rerun this demo function. But with uh, when I get to this line, instead of the count being 0, it will be the new count that I just set. So let's take a look at what that actually looks like in practice. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to update this button, uh, the text of this button, to be clicked count times. And the next bit I'm going to do. Uh, it's, I guess I suppose display that. So next thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually bind a callback to this button that responds when I click it and will increment the count. And I do that through this kind of special name on click. And I'm going to assign a lambda to it, which gets an event as an argument. And then the action of this callback is that I'm going to increment the count. Count plus one. And there we go. Oops. Don't need that. There we go. So now when I click this, it'll increment the count. OK. Um, so I was a little out of order. But, but yeah, that's the end of my talk about IDOM and how it's like React, but in Python.